so tonight, I want to speak to everyone about service. As I spoke earlier in terms of the different ministries we have that are available here at this church, it all starts with a call to your heart to serve. And as a member of our worship ministry, I can tell you, serving is not always easy. Somebody felt that as I said it, yes. Serving is not always e easy. Serving under the Lord is certainly not always easy. And so tonight, the title for tonight's message is Serving Within God's No. Thank goodness nobody left. I just knew I was gonna preach to an empty house once I said God's no. Nobody wants to hear about God's no. God's no is hard to deal with. God's no is harsh, especially when you're serving underneath him. When you know that you are walking in alignment with him and you are checking in with him step by step, day by day, and you are moving and you are flowing in the anointing, and then all of a sudden, you get a no. It's like, oh, you remember those uh, Looney Tunes cartoons where the road runner would be going top speed and then he would hit the edge of the cliff and be like, Shh. that's what the no from the Lord feels like. It just stops you dead in your tracks. But one of the fascinating things about receiving a no from God is it's a really awesome moment to check in with your heart to serve. That's one of the wild things about receiving a no from God is it, it may hurt, but if you dig a little deeper with him, if you allow him to show you what's happening on the inside of you as you react to and deal with and encounter the no, we find that we learn so much more about ourselves. We learn so much more about our motivation to serve whatever it may be in that moment all of a sudden, our motives, whether they are pure or not, become crystal clear. Because everybody can serve under God's yes. God's yes is awesome to serve under. The blessings just start falling out the ceiling. You're moving. Everything is happening in accordance with what you do. Every step you take feels anointed. Every thought you have feels anointed. Everything you do is just anointed. People are just hugging up on you just to try to get some anointing off of you. It's just crazy. But when that no hits and you look around and there's no blessing, so to speak, and there's nothing in that moment that is, hmm, there is no motivation that stems from blessing that allows you to keep moving forward. Sometimes we get caught in the cycle of being motivated by his blessings. And as we spoke of overflow, in the overflow of blessing, if we don't catch ourselves, we'll find that we're just motivated just to get to the next blessing. He's blessing me so much, I just have to serve because of the blessing, because I need to make my way to the next blessing. And the dangerous part about that is we, at some point, we'll get caught in an in-between where we're between an old blessing that's already done and the new blessing that hasn't quite happened yet. And now we're in the middle of the two, searching for motivation. And it's hard to move forward when you're searching for motivation. It's hard to continue to do it with the joy of the Lord in your heart when that joy isn't really there. So tonight, we're going to talk about serving within God's no. I want to start in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 8 through 9, and give you some, a quick backstory as to what's happening here. Now, King David, who we've spoken of a couple weeks ago, King David has been one of the most arduous servants for God up until this point. You have to think about it. He started off as a herder of sheep. He has now become king. Not only did he make his way from being a sheep herder to becoming king, it was the way he went about doing it to me that is so fascinating. 
because he was literally being chased by the person who he was going to replace. He could have taken his promotion into his own hands at any given point in time. And yet, he continued to wait and wait and wait, and he said, not by my hand, but God, by your hand. Even when God's anointed one, who was Saul, was acting the fool, he still honored him because God's hand was on him. Touch not God's anointed, regardless, uh, regardless of his opinion about the one who was anointed. And so he very patiently waited. He avoided getting killed and winds up as king. And so we find David in this moment where he wants to bless the Lord. He says, it, it's awesome. In the beginning of this chapter, it starts off with David being at rest from his enemies. So he's conquered, he's conquered. The Lord has brought him through series after series of battles. He's clearly managed to survive Saul and his, and his minions. And now he says, I, I just, I have to bless the Lord. So he comes up with this really awesome idea. He says, you know what? God has been carried around in a little tabernacle all of this time. I want to build something special. I want to build something for him. I want to build a, 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 an establishment, a sanctuary for his presence that truly brings him the honor and glory that he deserves. So he tells Nathan the prophet, this is what he wants to do. Nathan says, go ahead and do it. Do what is, that, what is in your heart. And then God has to correct that because actually God has different plans. And so God is speaking to Nathan the prophet. He now has to send Nathan back with some different news. And he says, now, therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you and you have ma and have made you a great name like the name of the great men who are on the earth we'll pause right there so god is telling david all of the things that he's done for him up until this point i love it because god is such a compassionate god he's such a, a loving god he's, he's 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 letting him know listen i know you want to do this thing for me I have done all of these things for you. So he, he, he lets him know, and then he hits him with the no. One of the interesting things about what David was after, David wanted to honor God according to what came to him in a vision. He said, I want to build this thing for him. I want to build this thing for the God I serve. God now has to rearrange things a little bit. See, sometimes we have an idea of what we think should happen. We have a vision of what we think should happen, and our hearts are clear. David's heart is completely pure about this. There is no motive other than wanting to bring glory to God. Trust me, we are all going to have this moment where as we are serving God, whether we are serving God in this house, in a ministry, or whether we are serving him in our own time, in our own way, where out of the pureness of our hearts, we have a vision, we have something we feel is so important that we need to do to bless him. And that's not what's going to happen. I love it because God reminds him of everything he has done for him. He says, look, I brought you from here to here. I have protected you. I've cut off your enemies. I've done all of these things for you. And now the next verse. We'll go to verses 12 through 13. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your forefathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. So now he's telling him, I'm going to bless your seed. I'm going to bless your son to come. 
Next verse. He shall build the house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. This is the nicest no I think I've ever heard in my life. I almost didn't notice it was a no when I read it. God was so smooth with this. Can we go back? Go back to 12. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I mean, he's painting a good picture. And I will set up your seed after you and you will, who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. So now we're talking generational establishment. David shows up wanting to build God a sanctuary. God responds and says, no. But this is what I'm going to do for you and said, this is the greatest no ever. I wish no's could be like this all the time. No, but you're going to bless me with something greater? Oh, okay, well, yeah, let's do that then. Next verse. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. It is so hard to have a vision that we want to enact, that we want to do, that is so clear in our minds, and to get the word that the vision is not for us. It doesn't mean that this vision was not valid. Clearly, it was a valid vision because everything that David wanted to do came to pass. It just didn't come to pass through David. It came through his son, Solomon. So, see, when we're serving in our zeal, in our passion, in our eagerness to serve, we will receive visions. We will receive plans. We will receive, and this coming clearly from the pureness of our hearts, we'll receive a plan in a way that we feel we can bless God. Just because that plan happens, just because that plan happens under someone else's name doesn't mean that the plan is not valid. The hardest thing we have to accept sometimes is some of the great things that God has put in our minds to do ain't for us. And this is where the heart of service comes into play. When our names are going to be attached to it, when our glory is going to be attached to it, it's very easy to serve a vision. But when it comes to a vision that is not for us, when it comes to a vision that we may not even live to see the fruition of, are we still as eager? Are we still as passionate? This is the test of serving within God's no. David wanted to do something amazing, but it wasn't meant to happen through him. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Based on the numbers of people who are in this house right now, someone here will probably join one of our ministries. Clearly out of the heart of wanting to serve. Here's one of the things that happens in ministries that most people won't tell you about. But guess what? I'm going to tell you. Someone always has a great idea. Someone always has a great idea. It is a wonderful idea. It's the best idea that's ever happened since the last idea that you had. It's awesome. And you bring forth this idea, you've got the plan, you've got the bullet points and everything, and you bring it forth to the person who is over the ministry, and they say no. So then it becomes a question of what do you do then? What really is at play is, why are we serving? A lot of times we serve, whether we want to admit it or not, there is a spirit of acknowledgement that lays hold of us. And we don't even realize it's happening. We start off with the heart purely to serve. And then we receive a little acknowledgement. And it does something to us. And if we're not careful, if we don't catch it, if we don't pay attention to that thing taking root, all of a sudden we are serving strictly for the acknowledgement. Yeah. The only thing we're doing is serving to receive the next acknowledgement. So it's like we become acknowledgement junkies. 
Like, I just need to get that next, I'll do whatever it takes to get the next acknowledgement high. And when we serve from this place, the problem is we wear ourselves out because at some point, the acknowledgement that we are now yearning doesn't take place. And now all of a sudden, our motivation dries up. Slowly, it's never an immediate thing. It's not all of a sudden, I don't wanna do this anymore. It's, you know, I'm just not as willing to do this as I was yesterday. And then the next day, yeah, I just don't, you know, maybe I'm, there might be some other things I could do better with my time. Am I stewarding my time wisely, Lord? Should I really be a part of this ministry, Lord? Should I really be serving in this capacity? All of a sudden, questions that we were not asking when we originally signed up to serve for him. When we agreed to do that which God put in our hearts to do, all of a sudden we start having questions. And it comes down to what is our original motivation in that moment. One of the things we always have to remember is that everything we do, I believe this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, everything we do, we do unto the glory of God. And I used to think that was a cool thing to say, and it keeps my mind focused up there, and it keeps me lofty. All of those things are true. But one of the most logical reasons to do that is because if we do it for the glory of man, man is forgetful. God remembers everything. Everything you do is already in God's memory. He's already set aside the response and the blessing that comes in, in response to what you do. But man, we forget. Not only do we forget, sometimes we just don't notice. And it's not necessarily out of a, an absent spirit. It's just there's a lot of things happening around, and sometimes the people you are serving under just didn't get a chance to notice that which you did. If we become so desperate for the acknowledgement high from man that that's all we depend upon, when we don't get it, now we're not serving. And now the ministry suffers and here's the part we don't recognize, we suffer too, because there is an anointing for serving. So we begin to interrupt our own anointing. The anointing that God has appropriated for us and him as we are in service to him becomes interrupted. And now everything becomes a lot harder than it used to be. And so I want to make sure that we are continuously checking our hearts. Why are we serving in the capacity that we are? And this goes beyond the ministry at this church or the ministry at another church. Community service, whatever it is God has placed you in, whatever capacity God has placed you in to serve, always remember that the only reason we should be doing it is for him. And so if we never get acknowledged, it's perfectly fine. In fact, if we can, when we have those moments, if we continue to focus on what God has done in our lives already, instead of seeking glory, we're already taking notice of the glory that he's already had upon us up until that point in time. I love the earlier passage where God lays out everything that he's done in David's life. He's like, look, I know you want the glory for building this sanctuary, but look at all of the glory you've already had in your life with me in it. Meditate on that. And when you meditate on all of the past glory that God has put over your life, all of a sudden we'll find, we'll find that we're not as hungry, we're not as desperate, we're not as needy for the next glory high. Because we can look and say, oh, God's brought me through this, God has brought me through here, I look like this in this season, he did this for me, he brought me through here, he put me in this position to succeed, he gave me this promotion, he gave me this job, he's moved me forward, there wasn't a job, he still blessed me, he sustained me, he moved me, he matured me. 
When we can focus on those things and remember the God that we serve, it becomes so much easier because once we remember the God that we serve, we can put him back in his place, which is at the foundation of the reason we're serving to begin with. So in the nicest way possible, God tells David, no, this is not for you. We'll move on to verse 16, please. Hmm. Oh, this is great. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne will be established forever. Now, this is based solely on David wanting to serve God so eagerly. God says, wow, you want to do this for me? You can't. No. But here, because of the posture of your heart, here's what's going to overflow into your life. I love that David receives this, and he receives it with the heart of a servant. He says, okay, this is what's going to happen. Let's move to verse 20. This is David's response. Now, what more can David say to you? For you, Lord God, know your servant. For your word's sake and according to your own heart, you have done all these great things to make your servant know them. Thanks for the reminder, God. Therefore, you are great, O Lord God. For there is none like you, nor is there any God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. Look at the praise that comes after a no. Look at the acknowledgement that comes after the no. If we could allow ourselves to put forth a vision and have God say no, and say words like this with a heart like this, that is what allows God's overflow of presence to be in our lives over and over and over and over and over. Glory to glory to glory to glory to glory. This posture of heart is what allows service to continue uninterrupted. And the anointing that is on service to continue to flow in our lives. You are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you nor is there any God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. We'll go to verse 25. Oh, love this. Now, O Lord God, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as you have said. So not only does he receive the no, he says, now, Lord, in accordance to your will, let it be. See, it's one thing to deal with God's no. It's, one, it's another thing to get into alignment with his no. It's a whole other ball game to literally place our hearts behind his no and support it and say, God, this is what I wanted to do. This is what was in my heart. I'm disappointed, I didn't get to do it, but that's fine because it's your no, because you are awesome, because you are mighty, because you are everlasting, because you are filled with glory, because you are so holy, because you have made me. So I can't question your no, because you know far more beyond with your no than I could ever know with my own yes. I love what David does next. We'll go to, perfect, thank you. So let your name be magnified forever, saying the Lord of hosts is the God over Israel, and let the house of your servant David be established before you. Now by house, he means lineage. So God has spoken, not only, I know you wanted to build this house for me, not only am I going to build your son, I am establishing, build your house, I'm establishing your line, I'm establishing your lineage, and oh, by the way, I'll build you a house too. This is the best no ever. 
Go to the next verse, please. Now here in Chronicles, we find what David does next. I love this. He's received the no, and he's moved on. And now, remember, the promise, the vision that he had was promised not to him, but to his son Solomon. Not only does he support the no, not only does he get his heart behind the no, he takes the next step. As for you, my son Solomon, the vision was not for him. The vision was for his son. Yet here he is speaking to his son, and this is what he does. As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intent of the thoughts. This is firsthand knowledge. He just had an encounter with God where in his heart he wanted to honor him by building a sanctuary. And God honored the intent of his thoughts with this. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Now he's speaking wisdom. It's not, not only does he accept this, no. He takes it to the next level. He says, listen, you are the one appointed for this vision that I wanted to have for me. I'm going to sow wisdom into you. When we allow ourselves to get to the place where the vision that we want for us, with the understanding that we have, we thought was for us, we can not only get behind God's no, but then we find the person that that vision is for and sow into them. That is truly getting in alignment and getting behind God's plan. It says, consider now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Then David gave his son Solomon oh, the plans for the vestibule, its houses, its treasuries, upper chambers, its inner chambers, and the place of the mercy seat. Pause right there. God gave him a vision. God gave him the blueprint to the plan. God gave him the provision to make the plan happen and said, you have all of these things, but this vision is not for you. He takes all of it and sows it to where God has anointed for the vision to take place. Next level wisdom, next level service is when you can take your great idea, the great idea that's supposed to have my name on it, the great idea I'm supposed to get the credit for, the great idea I'm supposed to get the glory for, the great idea that's supposed to elevate me and bring me promotion. Next level service is when you can hear the voice of God and God says this great idea that you have is going to happen, but it's not going to happen the way you think. And if you really love me, if you are really here to serve me, you will sow this idea and you will sow this vision where it is meant to be sold. <laughs> Too many people want to take their ball and go home. You have that moment. It's my idea. I put in the blood, sweat, and tears. I put in the work, I did the research, I drew the blueprints, I looked up everything, I did the bulletin, the little bullet points, I printed out the photocopies, I paper clipped them, I collated them, 40 copies for the whole ministry, everybody, I hooked it up, I did the thing. And God says, that's great, but your name's not going to be on it now. Hold up. I'm going to do all this work. And nobody's going to know I did it. Nope. The fascinating thing I've seen about ministries in the time that I've been here at one church, 
There are people, and I'll speak specifically about the, uh, the worship ministry. There are people who served in the worship ministry four, five, six years ago. Most people here do not know their names. Yet without them, we wouldn't have this ministry. There are people who served in our media and tech department two, three years ago. Without them, without the hard work that they put in just to get us to this place, you wouldn't know, but you don't know their names. All of the hard work that we do, all of the sewing that we do when God gives us a vision is not always going to bring name recognition to us. But when we're really invested in what God has told us to do, when we're really invested in what God has in store for us, then it doesn't really matter because we're serving him and we're serving his vision. We're not serving for the acknowledgement of man in a moment. It's interesting because acknowledgement, I think a lot of times we take acknowledgement from man as confirmation where, where we're supposed to be. Like if I'm working and I get a commendation, then clearly I'm where I'm supposed to be because of the commendation. And that's dangerous thinking. I'll give you an example. When I first came out here, I used to work at the Cheesecake Factory. I was a server. I was a good one. You know, have those meetings where all the servers get together. And they say, server of the week is. And I got a couple of them. Can you imagine if all I did was wake up in the morning with the express intent and purpose of becoming server of the week at that restaurant? I would still be at that restaurant. I wouldn't be doing any of the things God has called me to do. I wouldn't be standing here right now. I'd be like, yeah, but I won employee of the month eight straight times. Well, that's cool, but if that's the only intent that's there, that's all you're gonna have. And just because I'm receiving employee of the week, servant of the month, all the time, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's where God has me to be. Because there could be someone who will never be employee of the week, never be employee of the month, be gone in two weeks, but that's because God didn't want them to be there. So now I'm holding my plaques. I've got my certificates. I'm like, oh, I was employee of the month like 30 times in a row. <laughs> Meanwhile, the other person who's anointed by God to be where he or she is supposed to be is holding on to a whole lot more than what I'm holding on to. That's why it's so dangerous to attach acknowledgement from man with alignment and destiny. So how willing are we at any given moment to sow into the vision that God has giving us, given us, knowing that it's very possible we may not be a part of that vision? David gave his son Solomon the plans for the vestibule, its houses, its treasuries, upper chambers, inner chambers, and the place of the mercy seat. Last, next verse. And the plans for all that he had by the spirit of the courts of the house of the Lord, of all the chambers all around, of the treasuries of the house, and the treasuries of the dedicated things. I love that it came to him according to the Holy Spirit. How obedient is David in this moment? Not only has he found out that these plans that he drew up, the treasury that he amassed, David paid for this temple. He paid for the sanctuary. He literally set aside large portions of his wealth just for this to happen for someone else. I love it because at this moment, David is honoring so many different anointings at once. He's honoring his anointing as king. He's honoring his anointing as a father because he's sowing into his son. 
And all at the same time, he's honoring his anointing as a servant of God, supporting the vision that was given to him. That's where we need to be as we serve. God is going to put us in positions where there are many different anointings on us that we have to honor. And we won't be able to honor all of them in full unless we are in the heart posture and the mind and the spirit of service. It is the service that allowed David's anointing as king to be fully, fully vetted. The covenant that God made with him to establish his house and to establish his lineage does not happen if David doesn't come forth and say, God, I have a vision. And then he finds out the vision is informed and he says, okay, fine, I'm gonna support it anyway. So he supports this vision, which is for a time he will never see. And the anointing is also for a time he will never see. His anointing extends beyond him just being king. Now his entire line is blessed. Serving within God's no is not easy. I would love to tell you that it is. It is not Serving within God's no is what calls our hearts into question at that given moment. Why are we serving? And I will say this, when we have the moment, because it will happen to all of us, when we have the moment where we come to the understanding that we are not serving for the purposes of God, that's not a moment to go run, ah, and stop. No, that is a self-examination moment. If we can worship and say, fill me up, God, fill me up, Lord, love of God, overflow, permeate all my soul. If we can worship in that way, why can't we serve in that way? The moment we check our hearts, the moment God says no, and we don't like it, and suddenly we don't want to serve anymore, there's no reason we cannot call upon the overflow of God's love, God's patience, God's mercy, God's grace, and his presence to get our hearts right, to get our minds right, so that we are now serving unto him. Normally, I challenge, I love to give challenges. Today, tonight, I want to encourage I want to encourage everyone here that when God says no, I promise you it's for something greater. If God says no, it doesn't mean, oh, my heart's not pure. David's heart was pure. He had a vision so great, it wasn't even for him. He had a, he had a future vision. That's how in alignment and how pure-hearted he was. God allowed him to literally have a future vision. He just didn't understand it was a future vision. He thought it was a present vision with him in it. And that in itself is a blessing. But when God says no, we can't allow that no that will come at some point in time to interrupt serving him. And we can't have the attitude of, hmm, ooh, ooh, yeah, all right, we're going to go there. We can't serve him half-heartedly. We can't allow the no to literally divide our hearts in half so that we have the half that's for him and the half that's mad at him. And so now we're serving literally half-hearted. And we've got to fight with the half that's mad at him because we don't want to really admit that it's mad at him. So now we have this internal conflict. We're supposed to be serving pure-hearted, clear motivation. But now we have heart issues because half of our heart is so upset with this no or so dismayed by this no that it's now competing with the half of our heart that we know we're supposed to have. We can't serve God half-heartedly. And, and serving God with a full heart means not only honoring his no, because David didn't just honor his no, he championed his no. He said, oh, no? 
Okay, cool. Who is this vision for? Full support behind him. Everything I have is for the person this vision is appointed for. I had a really funny discussion with a, a good friend of mine a, a couple years back. He wanted to cast me in a film. Actually did cast me in the film. I wasn't able to do it, I got sick. But we had a really hilarious discussion because when, when writers write films, they have dream casts in mind. And they're like, you know, I, I, for this role, I picture this person. It's so a long story short, he was looking for financing for his film, and we joked. I was like, listen, if you are looking to get your vision funded, if you're looking to get your movie funded, and somebody says, I'll fund your movie, but you know, that guy right there, meaning me, but that guy can't do it because I want Don Cheadle to do it. I'm like, get Don Cheadle to do it. This is not hard, but I was able to say that because I knew a couple of things. One, I knew that God's blessings extend far beyond one opportunity. Two, I knew that if it was for me, it was going to be for me. And I also knew that if it wasn't for me, God's choice was going to be better anyway. So go ahead. If they say, listen, this is the only way this happens, because I was serving the vision. It was not about me. I could have totally been the guy to be like, I don't care what's happening. You cast me, blah, 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 blah. No, it was not my vision. I was blessed to even be considered to be a part of it. And so this is the mindset and this is the heart posture and the spirit we all need to flow in. And the amazing part about it was, not only did his vision wind up coming to pass, no Don Cheetah wasn't in it, <laughs> but he wound up actually putting forth his first film and I supported it in as many different ways as I could. And I was just as enthusiastic supporting it as if I was in it. I wasn't in it, I got nothing out of it anymore but I still supported it anyway. We have to continue to search out, Father, you want me to serve. How do you want me to serve? This vision that you've given me, and this is the key question, who is it for? Because in our minds, we're the star of our own movie. Every vision we get, we're in the middle of it. It's for me, it's for me to do. I'm gonna co, I'm the captain, and I'm in the middle of it, and I'm gonna handle all of it. And honestly, that's not always the case. Sometimes you have a vision, and not only is it not for you, it may literally not even be for this time, which means you may not be alive to see it come to fruition. You may not be alive to see the tens, hundreds, thousands, millions of people, your vision will bless. We can't afford to go at that vision with any less enthusiasm and with any less support and with any less of a spirit of service. Because all of a sudden, God has shown us the fullness of the vision and we're not in it. So tonight I wanna to encourage everybody Serving within God's no is hard, but I tell you, it's a beautiful struggle to do it. It's an amazing struggle to do it because it literally shows us where our hearts are, what work we need to do on our hearts, and at the end of it, oh, at the end of it, as you can see with David, the blessing will extend far beyond the moment of that vision. Serving God always has oh, the anointing that comes with serving within God's vision is something that far outstrips what we can imagine. And as long as we know that, as long as we know we serve a God who is so capable, he can take your vision, which looks grand in the moment when you have it, and expand it beyond the limits of our minds when you know that you can serve a God who's capable of doing that, it makes it so much easier to trust him with your vision. And it makes it so much easier to trust his vision for you. 
God's vision for all of us includes yeses and noes. Whether it's a yes or no, it is his vision. And we have to make sure that we are going at it just as hard, regardless, just because it's his vision. Let's stand. Everyone here has access to God's vision for their lives. We just have to be bold enough and we have to be courageous enough to accept the fullness of it and to accept it regardless of what it looks like. I wanna call some people forward. If you know you have received a glimpse of God's vision for you, and for whatever reason, whether it was fear because of the epic scope of the vision, or whether it was disappointment at your role or lack thereof in the vision, if you know you've received a vision from God and haven't fully gotten behind it, haven't fully supported it for whatever reason in your life. Come on down. Come on down. It takes bravery to even receive God's visions. Come on down. It takes courage to even look for God's vision in your life. Come on down. so interrupted or has not even begun yet to receive his vision, come on down. We're going to open up the lines of communication right now.
we ask for overflow and we sure got it. Heavenly Father, mighty King of Kings, great and awesome God that you are, tonight is a night where we come under the anointing of serving you, of being submitted to your vision. So Father, I pray that you open up the windows of heaven. Father, we've asked you to pour out blessing beyond what we can imagine. This night, Lord God, begin to pour out your vision over your people. Let the hearts of your people be open in a way like it has never been open before. Let the spirit of your people be receptive in a way like it has never been receptive before. Father, pour out your vision. Let each person in this place, let each person receiving this message receive your vision. Father, this night, we pray a clean and clear communication with you, Father. All of the static noise, we rebuke it right now in the name of Jesus. All of the fuzz that comes with changing frequencies, we rebuke it in the name of Jesus. We want the clear channel, the clear line directly to your voice, Lord God. changed by the revelation of your vision. 